Welcome everyone to the November seminar in the Dionoi Institute of Philosophy seminar series featuring Dr. Garrett Cullody. This is the inaugural Dionoi annual seminar in ethics and metaethics and the final seminar of our 2021 seminar series. My name is Nevin Kleimenhaga. I'm a senior research fellow here at Dionoia and the organizer of our seminar series. Australian Catholic University established the Dionoia Institute of Philosophy in April 2019 to build a world leading research center in analytic philosophy. Our name comes from the Greek word Dionoia, which means thought and is used by Plato in the Republic to denote the reflective and discursive reasoning that leads from mere opinion, doxa, to knowledge or understanding, nous. This year, we launched our online seminar series in philosophy, showcasing research by leading philosophers around the world. A couple notes before we begin the seminar. This event is being recorded and it will be put on our website after the seminar. Dr. Cullody's talk will go for about 45 minutes and then we'll have an hour for Q&A. If you have a question you would like to ask in the Q&A, please message me directly and I will add you to the queue. Finally, it is our custom at Australian Catholic University to give an acknowledgement of country. We commence our meeting by acknowledging the first peoples and the traditional custodians of the country where Dionoia is located, the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation. We respectfully acknowledge their elders past and present and remember that they have passed on their wisdom to us in various ways. Let us hold this in trust as we work together and serve our communities. And now I am pleased to introduce our speaker. Garrett Cullody is professor of philosophy at Australian National University. His work ranges across theoretical and applied topics in moral and political philosophy. His talk for us today is entitled Participatory Moral Reasons, Their Scope and Strength. All right, over to you, Garrett. Thanks very much, Nevin. Uh, delighted to be here and many thanks for the invitation. Um, I do have some slides, so I'm gonna share my screen. <laughs> Um, and just put these up. So are those um, visible okay? Yep. yep. Great. Okay, so um, my aim today is to address two questions that arise in connection with um, what I call participatory moral reasons. Um, I'm going to begin by explaining uh, what I mean by that phrase, um, and then I'll introduce my two questions. Um, so, uh, I take it that it's a familiar part of ordinary moral thought um, that morality gives us reasons to join in worthwhile group activities uh, and not to join in bad ones. Um, and we can start to explain this um, by taking the positive cases first. Um, and these belong, as I see it, to two main kinds. Um, first of all, there are cases in which others are working to promote the common good, the good of the group. Um, and morality gives me a reason to share the burden uh, with others. So examples of this include um, administrative burdens in, in your academic department, picking up your litter when you, when you go to the beach, um, going to a cafe and seeing that uh, the, there's a, a group of us, uh, it would make sense to put the tables together and joining in to do that. Um, so here, what makes the joint action worthwhile is that it serves the interests of members of the group. And then there's a second uh, group of cases in which what we're doing is to work together for the sake of others. Um, we're treating non-members of the group morally well. Um, we're perhaps joining a demonstration, uh, joining with others to support a charity, lobbying for justice, uh, for example. Um, so that's a first group of cases where morality, I, I take it in ordinary thought, gives us positive reasons to participate on the same terms as others uh, in worthwhile joint actions of those kinds. Um, and it also uh, gives us uh, reasons not to participate in morally bad joint actions, not to join a gang that's uh, up to no good. Um, there are also uh, hybrid cases uh, where um, the reasons for joining are partly to do with the good of the group and partly to do with uh, benefiting uh, those who aren't members, joining the volunteer fire brigade and so on. Um, now, the, this claim, the one I'm imputing to ordinary moral thought, um, is a claim about uh, reasons, uh, as, as I put it. And what I mean by that is just pro tanto reasons, reasons that 
count to some degree in favor of uh, doing something that might be uh, overridden or outweighed. Um, but at least sometimes uh, we make stronger moral claims. Um, and we claim that there are uh, participatory moral requirements. Um, so paying your taxes is an example of this. Uh, the, there's a requirement to join in with the practice of doing that. Um, there can be cases of uh, joint rescue uh, where there's a group of us who could uh, save someone um, and you're required to join in. Um, and then in the negative direction, um, there are moral requirements not to join in uh, a criminal enterprise. Now, sticking with our starting points here, um, I, th I think it's also part of ordinary moral thinking that in uh, recognizing these reasons, these participatory reasons, we display a distinctive pattern of thinking that is expected of a morally decent person. Um, I'm going to label this collective thinking. Uh, and this primarily focuses on what we ought to do and then takes the answers to that as reason giving for me. Um, so it thinks about my agency as a member of the group. Um, and this, I take it, is a distinctive sort of unselfishness uh, that regards a pair of facts as providing a reason for contributing. So this is a, a view about the content of uh, positive participatory reasons, that when I see that we can together do or are doing something worthwhile, when people situated like me contribute, um, uh, that's seen as counting in favour of my contributing. Now, I've used this phrase worthwhile. I think the way um, this should be interpreted um, is just in terms of when there are sufficient reasons uh, to do something. Um, of course, that leads to the question, uh, when are reasons sufficient? Um, and I think nothing short of a complete uh, normative moral theory is going to give you an answer to that. What I'm examining is the transition from the recognition that there's sufficient reason for us to be doing something together um, to the participatory reasons of individuals. Um, and uh, a last comment by way of uh, scene setting or, or setting uh, the, the terms of this starting point, as I'm putting it, is that I think the way ordinary thought about these uh, reasons works is that requirements to act on them uh, are generated when there's no good answer to the question, why aren't you willing to join in on the same terms as everyone else? Um, and we naturally uh, phrase complaints of this kind as complaints concerning unfairness. Now, if we take uh, these claims uh, to be an accurate description of uh, part of the content of ordinary moral thought. You, you may question that, and uh, I'd be most interested in uh, uh, anyone who thinks that's a misdescription. Uh, uh, we can pursue that uh, in the discussion. Um, but if uh, we take that uh, as an accurate description of ordinary moral thought, then there are two kinds of uh, philosophical um, activities we might then want to engage in. One will be asking what can be said to vindicate these claims. Um, and although I've got some views about that, that's, that's not the uh, topic that I'll be investigating today. I'll be asking some questions that lie downstream, not upstream of uh, this depiction of an a set of ingredients of ordinary moral thought um, and asking uh, if we accept this starting point, where does it take us? And so this, takes me to the two questions I want to um, investigate today. Um, these are two questions that arise pretty immediately. Um, first, I'm going to call the scope question, and the second, the requirement question. So the scope question is, what are the groups with respect to which I have participatory reasons? And I'm going to break that uh, down into a, a set of subsidiary uh, questions. So firstly, what conditions must a group meet in order to generate participatory reasons? Um, there's a, a spectrum of different possibilities uh, that we might look at um, for uh, the description of the relevant kind of joint action um, that uh, we need to be performing in order for there to be a moral reason for me to join in. Um, and in a moment, I'll, I'll talk about the spectrum of possibilities and say where I think on that spectrum uh, the answer to this first question lies. What's the relevant kind of joint action? 
And then once we've asked that, we can then ask at what level of resolution do we fix the group whose joint action is worthwhile or bad? Um, so if I say uh, donate to a charity um, and we want to ask whether the activities uh, of the group that I'm joining um, are activities that there's a sufficient reason to perform and therefore there's uh, a participatory reason for me to join in. Is the relevant group donors to Haiti earthquake appeals, donors to Oxfam, uh, more broadly donors to Western NGOs working in developing countries, or perhaps much more narrowly, Australian donors to the Oxfam appeal for the 2021 uh, Haiti earthquake. Um, uh, at what level of uh, resolution do we fix the group? Um, and then also under this scope question, I want to ask, um, once we've identified a group uh, that's uh, performing a worthwhile uh, joint action, there are very, very many uh, worthwhile joint actions in the world. Um, and under what conditions uh, uh, do I have the right sort of relationship to the group uh, for those reasons to apply to me? Um, uh, there are actions being taken to preserve architectural heritage in Samarkand. Um, there's a Shetlands Fishermen's Association. Um, so do I have participatory moral reasons to join those uh, activities or are they in some way too remote for me to generate such reasons? So um, those issues are bound up in this uh, question that I'm calling the scope question. What are the groups with respect to which I have participatory reasons? And then I also want to ask a question about requirements. How do we get from uh, pro tanto moral reasons uh, to requirements? Um, uh, when do participatory reasons give uh, rise to participatory moral requirements? Um, and is there anything general uh, that can be said by way of uh, explanation of that? Okay, so the agenda for the talk is going to be to work through those two questions. I'm going to be asking what answers to them cohere best with the simple patterns of thought that I began by describing. Um, uh, I'll uh, try to extract from that uh, answers to these two questions. Um, and then I'll give some applications of uh, my answers. Uh, and the number of applications uh, uh, that I get through will depend on um, when we hit the 45 minute uh, point. Okay, so let's start with the first part of um, our scope question. So what are the joint actions to which the participatory moral reasons recognised in collective thinking uh, apply? Um, and uh, what we should uh, start off by noticing is that uh, the actions which we describe linguistically uh, by attributing a plural subject to them, things that we do, um, can range from uh, a collection of individuals, each of whom performs an action of the same type. So um, uh, all of the individuals around the world today who perform a random act of kindness, um, uh, it can be said of us that we perform a random act of kindness. Um, uh, that's one end of the the spectrum of possible um, reference of the phrase joint action, um, right through to um, much more sophisticated uh, cases in which um, there are relationships of um, uh, intentional interaction between uh, members of a group um, that uh, ultimately can give us uh, something that's describable as a corporate agent, uh, an agent that makes its decisions by considering its reasons and implements them in its actions, um, and potentially uh, contains members who, who are bound by relations of common knowledge, um, uh, of uh, knowing each other's intentions to uh, contribute to um, uh, the agency of the group. Um, that involve forms of implicit or explicit agreement um, and involve relationships of reciprocity uh, through uh, mutual understanding of con conditional uh, mutual assistance uh, to each other. Um, and I think that when we ask 
what answer to the question, which actions generate uh, participatory reasons? Um, what answer to this question is implied by the picture of ordinary moral thought with which I began? Um, the answer to that lies in between these extremes. And I'm now going to um, spell out where I think it lies. Um, so what are the joint actions to which uh, the participatory moral reasons recognized in collective thinking apply? Well, collective thinking involves thinking as a member of a group. It responds to our ability together to achieve what none of us can achieve individually. Um, uh, it's that that generates the reasons that uh, the person engaged in collective thinking responds to. Um, and uh, what someone who engages in this style of thinking is doing is to recognize reasons for each of us to act as a contributor to what we do together on the same terms as other contributors. Um, so it's a concern with um, cases in which we can achieve what I can't achieve on my own. Our doing so requires that people situated like me contribute. Um, and each contributor performs their action as a contribution to what's done by the group. And I think that gives us a two-part um, definition of the joint actions to which the reasons recognized by this uh, form of thinking apply. Um, and uh, these are, are the actions to which I'm going to reserve the label joint actions. Um, I'm just going to treat that use of the label as stipulative. Um, so a joint action, I'm going to say, is one that has a, an aim for which um, two conditions are satisfied. Firstly, each contributor to what the group does intends their individual action as a contribution towards the groups attaining that end. Um, and then secondly, the groups attaining the end is not equivalent to what's attained by any individual member. Um, and so uh, to illustrate the difference between those two conditions, um, if uh, each member of the department thanks the speaker on, de on behalf of the department, um, then that's going to be a case uh, in which um, uh, condition one is satisfied. Each contributor is intending their action um, as a contribution towards the department's thanking the speaker. Um, but uh, condition two is not satisfied. Um, uh, what's, what's been done is equivalent to what's attained by any individual. Um, and then uh, there are going to be cases which uh, satisfy condition two uh, without satisfying one. So if we all uh, travel home safely after the concert, um, then something is attained by the group, namely everyone's getting home safely. Um, but uh, I'm not um, uh, traveling home uh, with the intention of making a contribution to that uh, larger aim. And if that's uh, equally untrue of all the other um, concert goers, uh, then this doesn't count as a joint action either. Um, so on, on this uh, way of thinking, um, uh, it doesn't require stronger forms of collective decision making and agency. So cases like are all signing a petition um, or taking your rubbish home from the beach. Uh, will count as joint actions, um, the former being a contribution to showing the government that many pe people oppose a policy, the latter being a contribution to keeping the beach clean. Um, uh, those are gonna count as joint, joint actions, even if there's no um, uh, collective decision-making structure um, that uh, characterizes the participation of all the members of the, the group. Um, uh, but weaker, forms of uh, plural subject action, like the uh, collection of people performing random acts of kindness, um, uh, are not going to um, uh, qualify as the joint actions that generate uh, participatory moral reasons. These aren't the actions to which collective thinking applies. Okay, so um, that's an answer to the first part of the scope question on behalf of positive participatory reasons. Um, I think it's also the right answer to, to give 
in relation to uh, negative participatory reasons. Um, so the force of the positive reasons comes from the question, why aren't you willing to join in on the same terms as everyone else? The force of the negative participatory reasons comes from the question, why are you joining in that action? Um, why are you acting as a contributor towards that end? Um, at least it's that second way of glossing the question uh, in relation to uh, the joining in of bad actions um, that uh, engages with distinctively participatory um, uh, uh, forms of criticism. Um, there's a sense in which if we each perform individual actions and then the aggregate uh, effect of what we do is something bad, um, you could ask, why are you joining in um, the practice of uh, using lots of plastic packaging, let's, let's say. Um, but that could intelligibly uh, be uh, asked equally about uh, cases in which um, I'm making a causal contribution to some bad effect that's not produced by other agents. Um, so it's when uh, these two conditions are met, that uh, there are contributors to a group who are intending their individual action as a contribution towards the groups attaining something. Um, and this isn't equivalent to what's attained by any individual, um, that distinctive forms of criticism that are criticisms for my directing my agency towards some bad collective end uh, are engaged. Okay. So this gives us an answer to the first part of the scope question. What's the relevant kind of joint action? And uh, it seems to me the answer that's implicit in uh, ordinary forms of thinking about uh, the morality of participation uh, suggest that uh, it's joint actions that satisfy those two conditions. Next question um, is going to be uh, how we determine the uh, the resolution of the groups to which this, uh, this answer applies. Um, but first, let's just notice some initial implications. Um, the first is that group members must be able to identify the group and intend their actions as contributions to what it does um, in order for that group to be the sort that generates participatory reasons. So um, I, for example, am an Australian moral philosopher of Anglo-Irish heritage who donates uh, money to Oxfam. Um, but people meeting that description don't intend their actions as contributions to what's achieved by that group. Um, so uh, there's no uh, relevant group um, whose uh, identity conditions are given by that description that generates participatory reasons. Secondly, very large groups can generate uh, participatory reasons. Um, so to take the plastic example, those who moderate their use of plastic as a contribution to substantially improving the state of the world's oceans um, do actually satisfy those two conditions for joint action. Um, uh, and they do so even though uh, no individual may make a significant expected difference to the, um, uh, the end um, that the group is uh, uh, contributing towards um, uh, attaining. Thirdly, um, cases of multiple backup over determination can count as joint action. So cases in which, say, each of us throws a life ring to uh, a drowning victim, um, uh, where the end in question is making it likely that the victim is rescued. Um, that's going to be a case in which um, that end uh, is not equivalent to something that's attained by any individual. Um, and so this also meets the description of joint actions. Um, and then fourthly, and importantly, um, groups can be nested within larger ones. Um, so donors to the Oxfam Haiti earthquake appeal belong to the larger group of donors to Haiti earthquake appeals. Um, and so uh, Oxfam is then uh, itself subject to participatory reasons. It has uh, participatory moral reasons to coordinate its actions with other agencies um, towards uh, the achievement of the larger ends of the larger group to which the smaller group belongs. Um, okay, so against that background, let's now ask 
the next of our component uh, questions uh, nest, nested under the scope question. At what level of resolution do we fix the group whose joint action is worthwhile or bad? Um, and given this understanding of the joint actions that generate these reasons, um, the answer to this is going to be that we identify um, the groups to which uh, participatory moral reasons apply by reference to the contributory intentions of their members. Um, uh, when each member of the group intends their individual action as a contribution to the groups attaining a given end, we can ask, what is the content of the, uh, the intention of the contributing members when, when they intend their contribution as a contribution towards the groups attaining this end? Um, and I suppose, as we've already seen, this is going to rule out some criteria of group identity. Uh, it's not going to uh, include Australian moral philosophers of Anglo-Irish heritage, et cetera, um, uh, because that's, that, that doesn't uh, correspond to the content of the contributory intentions. Um, but it leaves open several different um, uh, conditions of group identity uh, for any given uh, contributory action. Um, all those intending to contribute to the Oxfam Haiti earthquake appeal are also intending to contribute to Haiti earthquake appeals. Um, so it's gonna be a mistake to think that there's a single correct description of the joint action uh, to which I'm contributing. The same participatory action can be a contribution to more than one overlapping group. Um, and so what we need to ask for each of the overlapping groups that are unified uh, by the contributory uh, intentions of their members, um, are that group's actions worthwhile, bad, or neither overall? Um, and when we do so, uh, we should notice that there are two possibilities that arise. Um, one is that uh, there may be a larger group whose actions are worthwhile uh, that contains a subgroup whose actions are bad. Um, for example, um, maybe Haiti earthquake appeals overall are uh, doing uh, more good than harm, but Oxfam's actions may be doing more harm than good. Um, so under those circumstances, um, I have a positive participatory moral reason to contribute to the larger group, but not the smaller one. Um, and so under those conditions, I should find another agency to uh, donate to. Um, there's also uh, the converse possibility. A larger group whose actions are uh, overall bad might contain a subgroup whose actions are worthwhile. Um, maybe the uh, disaster relief efforts um, are harmful overall, um, but Oxfam's are doing uh, more good than harm. Um, then under those circumstances, there could be a negative uh, participatory moral reason for Oxfam not to be part of them and for me not to contribute to Oxfam. Um, but from there, we need to ask whether that uh, reason is overridden. Uh, it could be. And if so, Oxfam's action could still be worthwhile overall. Um, and I could have a positive participatory moral reason to contribute to it. Um, so uh, what I need to do is to think about the larger joint actions within which um, any given joint action to which I'm contributing uh, is nested um, and ask about the um, relevance of that uh, to my assessment of whether there's a sufficient reason um, for the smaller group to which I'm contributing uh, to be doing what it does. Okay, so we've now addressed um, what conditions must a group meet for it to generate participatory reasons? Um, and uh, now we, we need to turn to the final part of the scope question. Um, what conditions must I meet for those reasons to apply to me? Um, again, we can approach this by asking, what's the scope of the participatory moral reasons recognized by collective thinking in ordinary moral thought? Um, and 
we uh, get pointed in a similar direction in order to answer this question. Because um, once more, we need to ask when a joint action is occurring, what characteristic is recognized by contributors as membership uh, constituting? Um, in intending to contribute to the groups attaining an end, what specification of the group is contained in their intention? Um, and uh, this gives us a criterion um, for determining what uh, characteristics I need to have in order to be a bearer of uh, reasons to participate in the activities of this group. Um, so we ask, what, what characteristic, what's, what's the kind uh, such that we and people like me um, are uh, people of uh, kind K uh, whose recognition, the, the recognition um, of our possession of this characteristic by collective thinking participants explains why the joint action is occurring. Um, and I need to ask whether I possess that characteristic. So if uh, the action in question is picking up your litter from the beach, um, the relevant uh, characteristic is being a beachgoer. If it's paying your fare on the tram, it's being a tram user. Um, if it's donating to the earthquake appeal, it's having the resources to help earthquake uh, victims. Um, so when it comes to the Shetland Fishermen's Association, I need to be a Shetland fisherman to have a participatory moral reason to join in that. Um, uh, because it's the uh, recognition um, that uh, we Shetland fishermen can band together to look after um, our retired uh, uh, fellow fishermen. Um, that uh, explains why the action is occurring. Um, and I don't meet that description. Um, uh, in the case of the protection of the architectural heritage of Samarkand, however, um, I need to ask, is this a group of Uzbeks who are protecting their national heritage? Um, or is it a group of global citizens who are protecting humanity's cultural heritage? Um, and if there's a group of the latter kind um, that's set up, then uh, it does follow that I have a pro tanto uh, participatory moral reason to join in uh, that group. Um, now, that I, I think emphasizes uh, that there are a lot of participatory moral reasons. And this seems to me a plausible claim. But surely, given all the other things I could be doing instead, morality doesn't require me, all things considered, to give to the UNESCO uh, Samarkand Heritage Fund. Um, however, sometimes, as we saw to start with, I am required to participate, morally required to participate in the actions of a group. Um, so what determines that? Um, as before, I suggest we approach this by returning to the initial simple thought about participatory moral reasons. Different claims can be made by saying an action is morally required, um, but the sort of con conception of moral requirement that's in question um, when we're looking to uh, address the challenge, why aren't you willing to uh, join in on the same terms as everyone else, is a challenge concerning wrongness uh, conceived of in a particular way. Um, so this is not the only conception of wrong action, but it's one prominent conception um, that thinks of an action as wrong when among the reasons that are available to you, there are serious other regarding reasons against it and no adequate countervailing reason in its favour. Um, and it's wrongness on this conception that's being assessed when we ask about the positive cases, why aren't you willing to join in on the same terms as everyone else? Or in the negative cases, why are you acting as a contributor towards that end? Um, so let's ask what determines the adequacy of an answer to these questions? Um, and I'm going to make a suggestion and then fill it out in three ways. Um, what could count as a satisfactory way of answering this question? Well, here's a way uh, of meeting this challenge. Suppose that everyone had the same reasons I have for not participating in an action. 
And then we ask, could we collectively justify our not performing the joint action by appealing to these reasons? Um, if so, if that's so, then I'm not unfairly making a special case of myself when I appeal to these reasons to justify my own non-participation. Because a permission uh, for people who are relevantly similar to me uh, not to join in can reasonably be extended to everyone. I'm not claiming it uh, implicitly as a special privilege uh, for myself. Um, so I can answer the question, what's so special about you? Um, there are then three different ways that I can think of uh, of implementing this approach in a form uh, that's going to meet uh, the challenge. Um, so first of all, consider, uh, let's, let's go back to our littering example. And suppose uh, my litter blows down the beach just as I get an emergency phone call. Um, and under these circumstances, surely I'm not required uh, to pick up my litter rather than address the emergency call. Um, uh, and I can um, uh, justify what I'm doing in the following way. I can say, if everyone uh, had the same reasons as me, if we were all in the same position, then we should deal with the emergencies and not the less important litter collection. Uh, so I'm not failing to join in a worthwhile joint action on the same terms as everyone else uh, when I uh, answer the call rather than picking up my litter. Um, so that's a first kind of generalization test. Secondly, there can be cases where what makes the joint action worthwhile is that it's morally good. Uh, there are very many of these actions. Um, the cost of my participation may be no higher than anyone else's, but I may be able to say that everyone's action is morally good, uh, but not morally required. So mine is. Um, so I'm not at the moment uh, joining the volunteer park care group, um, but it's, it's the case that if all the volunteer park care group members uh, decided to say campaign for disability rights instead, um, they'd be doing nothing wrong. Um, so I'm doing nothing wrong if, if I do that. Um, however, if I uh, don't do support any worthwhile causes in, uh, with my spare resources, um, then I face the question, why aren't you doing that? Um, and lacking a good answer to that is going to make um, doing nothing uh, morally wrong. And then finally, um, there's a, a further kind of generalization test, um, which applies to uh, address the kinds of cases that uh, Nozick uh, imagines in arguing against forced contributions to pay for unsolicited goods. And so he imagines Cases like the following, um, someone comes and mows my lawn when I'm out uh, and then sends me a bill. Uh, and it just so happens that my neighbors uh, have been paying these bills uh, as a contribution to keeping the neighborhood looking nice. Um, and now in a, in a case of that kind, um, it's an implication of the things that I've been saying that there is a participatory moral reason to join in and pay. Uh, and I think that's actually correct. Um, but Nozick is right that it's not morally required. Um, and I think that can be uh, justified in the following way. If I were required to pay, then the same requirement could, in fairness, be made for any unsolicited service, provided there were other willing payers. Um, but this general practice would be commercially disastrous. Um, so I'm not making a special case of myself in refusing to uh, recognise the requirement. Um, so here, what we're asking is whether the practice of recognising as morally required all the further participatory demands, which would in fairness have to be so regarded if the demands of this scheme were regarded as morally required, um, is uh, not worthwhile. And consequently, I'm not making uh, any objectionably a special case of myself in refusing to recognize the requirement. Okay, and then finally, there's a um, corresponding generalization test that can help us to think about the cases of um, negative participatory reasons and negative requirements. Um, so here, once more, um, there can be cases in which uh, is perfectly morally okay um, not to uh, 
um, uh, be acting on a negative participatory moral reason. So, so take the gang type example. Um, if uh, I'm uh, invited to guard the door for a gang that's uh, bashing someone up inside a building, and I'm told that uh, my children will be uh, targeted by them if I don't do this. Um, if the threat is uh, credible enough, um, it could be, I, I think, morally okay to stand there on the door. Um, but I don't think it would be morally okay to uh, strike the blows myself. Um, and the way of uh, uh, defending that view, I think, is to ask uh, once more a, a generalization question. Suppose everyone had the same reasons as I have for making a contribution of the magnitude I make, could we then collectively justify our acting as we do by appealing to these reasons? Um, but I think uh, uh, in the case of guarding the door, I could say, look, if there's a group of us who have to guard the door in order to uh, save our children, um, then it would be okay for us to do it. So it can be okay for me to do it as well. Now, I'm going to skip over the next slide. That was um, uh, going to be talking about the difference between wrongness and obligation. And if people uh, are interested in this, we might want to return to this later. Um, but I just want to uh, fit in, I think, two of the um, uh, applications of this treatment of participatory moral reasons um, that may be of interest. So first of all, it gives us a distinction between two ways of being related to group harms. Um, firstly, uh, there's joining in a negligent or malicious joint action. Um, so here, when a joint action is morally bad, we have negative uh, participatory moral reasons and face the question, why are you contributing to that end? Um, and when uh, joint action uh, is directed by collective decision-making, we're answerable for the ends we haven't adopted. So they can be negligent um, or reckless joint actions. Um, but most of the harms we do together don't meet that description. Um, cases of environmental damage, uh, economic injustice, loss of heritage, and so forth. Um, these are instead uh, multiplicative many agent harms. Um, they're harms that occur uh, because many of us have uh, made a small contribution towards some large overall bad effect. Um, and here, the question, why are you acting as a contributor towards that end doesn't arise because you're not. Um, so these don't generate negative participatory reasons. However, they can generate positive reasons to join in mitigatory joint action where that's occurring. Um, so these aren't unilateral reasons. Uh, they're reasons to participate in an action that's already occurring. Um, and here, the relevant uh, participatory moral reasons are positive, not negative. Finally, I just want to uh, make an observation about um, something that I find interesting when um, we turn to cases of joint beneficent action. Um, requirements of beneficence are usually seen as depending on how much good can be done by an action and the cost of doing it. Um, and we can then ask, how do we apply this in cases of joint beneficent action? For example, rescue cases. There's a person who's drowning. Uh, there are four of us on the beach. Um, and there's a lifeboat there. Um, so uh, in these cases, one might be tempted to uh, answer the question, how large a cost can I be required to bear as a participant in a joint action of beneficence? Um, by firstly identifying the cost a single agent uh, could be required to bear, and then dividing that cost by the number of members of the group. Um, so if acting alone, I'd be required to exert myself to the limits of my safe capacity, um, then what this burden division reasoning would suggest is that when there are four of us, each of us is required to bear a quarter 
of that cost. So to exert ourselves to a quarter of the uh, limits of our safe capacity. Um, but that's pretty clearly wrong. Um, so uh, since uh, exerting myself to the limits of my safe capacity wouldn't be too much to ask of me to rescue someone on my own, um, each of us faces the question, why is that too much to ask of you as part of a joint action of rescue? Um, and what we can ask on behalf of the, the beneficiary is what cost are you uh, here uh, thought of plurally, distributively across the potential members of the group, willing to bear to benefit me? Um, uh, and when the benefit is large, why should I be willing to do any less as a member of the group as I would as a sole agent? Um, and that evidently doesn't have a good answer. Um, so what this means is that there's something wrong with burden division reasoning. Um, uh, and if so, what results is uh, what I am inclined to call a multiplier effect. Because as bene beneficent groups get larger, the expected benefit produced by their joint action can increase. But the cost I can be required to bear as a participant in joint beneficent action is not diluted by the size of the group. As, as it would be uh, if this burden division reasoning made sense. Um, so what results is a multiplier effect. It can be the case that a certain cost is too much to ask of me acting by myself to confer a benefit of a certain magnitude. Um, so it would take a week of my time after an earthquake digging in the rubble uh, to produce a very small chance of uh, saving someone. Um, and I'm not required to do so. But if there are many of us who spend a week digging the rubble together, we're very likely to save someone. So here, the same cost is not too much to ask of me as a participant in a large group acting together to confer a benefit of a much larger magnitude. Um, and I'll finish just with a, an application. I'll be interested to see what you think of this. Um, so here's uh, some figures that John Broom uh, works with uh, to um, quantify the expected harm associated with an average person's carbon emissions in the, in the Western world. Um, uh, so he, th he thinks the expected harm is in the region of six months of healthy human life lost. Um, but this could be offset by spending about $500 a year on offsetting. Um, now, is spending $500 a year um, something that can be required of me in order to produce an overall lifetime expectation of averting the loss of six months of healthy human life? Um, uh, perhaps not. Um, but suppose that uh, when I offset my carbon emissions, I'm doing so as a contribution towards the joint action performed by all of the offsetters around the, the world um, uh, to uh, avert a much larger harm. Uh, and in this case, we multiply the figures by a million. Um, so there are a million of us spending $500 a year. The expected value of that action is uh, averting the loss of 500,000 years of healthy human life. Um, uh, according to the multiplier effect, it's going to be pretty hard to justify the refusal to join in. Um, the question, why aren't you willing to bear this cost as a participant in joint action that does this much expected good is harder to answer. Okay, so I'll finish with a brief conclusion. Um, uh, I suspect that the other implication I was going to discuss will probably come up in the discussion anyway. We'll see about that. Um, but I'll just uh, conclude with these simple thoughts. So what I've been trying to um, suggest to you is that answers to the scope and requirement questions can be given that firstly, cohere with ordinary moral thought about the source of participatory moral reasons and requirements. Um, they do have uh, plausible implications and to that extent, they, they offer some uh, support for that initial starting point. Um, and they also provide some useful guidance in practical moral thought. Um, so 
I'll uh, leave my presentation at this point, and I'll be um, very interested to see what questions come up. All right, thank you very much for that stimulating talk. We will take a five minute break now and reconvene at about uh, five till 10 Melbourne time, so five till the hour um, for Q&A. Okay. okay, then let's go ahead and start the Q&A. Um, so we have about 50 minutes for a Q&A. And um, if you have a question you would like to ask, please send me a direct message in the chat and I will add you to the queue. Our first question is from Steve Finley. Uh, thanks very much, Garrett. Um, really interesting talk. Uh, there's lots I'd like to ask you about, um, but I'll try to restrain myself. Um, so I, I think the, the question I'm, I'm most interested in asking concerns what seem to be some of the basic assumptions yep. about how group reasons and individual reasons um, uh, interact, and and I should give credit here to um, Alex Dietz, uh, who whose ideas I, I think I'm, I'm channeling here. So you seem to be there seem to be an assumption that if that group reasons reasons for us entail reasons for um, each of us individually, and I just so. I wanted to follow Alex in, in challenging that assumption um, that uh, it may be that we as a group may have reasons without any of us as individuals having reasons. Um, and the kind of case, I, I mean, it, it's like if you think of an interpersonal professor procrastinate case, mm -hmm. right? So um, it may be, you know, the best thing that we as a group could do uh, would, be option, uh, would be option A say vote for a political party that would fix all the wrongs of the, of, of the world but as a matter of fact uh, I know and it's true that uh, not enough other people are going to vote for that particular political party um, and so you know if if I vote for that party then my vote will be wasted um, so the best thing that I can do is is vote for the second best party which at least is not those terrible people so it seems, you know, Alex argued, and I, and I, I'm pretty convinced that in a case like that, it's right to say that while we as a group may have a reason to vote for the best party, I as an individual may not have any reason. And in fact, nobody as an individual may have any reason to vote for the best party um, for the reason that, you know, um, I, each of us as an individual does not have the ability to achieve that end that we as a group have the ability to achieve. Um, yeah, so that's that's great. The question. Great. Um, so let me um, respond with um, a general point, and then then let me let me come back to you and see whether um, this actually speaks to the uh, objection or, or not. Um, so the general point is that um, as I'm conceiving of these, these are participatory reasons uh, in a sense that assumes that there, there is a joint action um, in which I can participate. Um, so it may be the case that we collectively ought to uh, increase the water reservoir capacity of Canberra, let's say. Um, uh, but if we're not doing so, um, then there isn't a reason for me to go and take my shovel into the hills outside Canberra and dig you know, my share of the reservoir that we ought to be digging together. Um, so that, that's what I meant by at one point saying that these are non-unilateral reasons. Um, so at least as you described the example, um, uh, I'm, I don't have a reason to cast my vote when other, other people aren't going to do so. And so the, uh, the collective action isn't going to take place. Um, uh, and my claim is not that whenever there's a reason for um, a group to perform an action, then there's a reason for 
the individual to perform the action that would have made sense as a contribution to, to the activity of the group. Um, but then when a group is performing an action that's worthwhile um, and it's being performed relies on others uh, to be contributing. Um, uh, and my condition, my situation is not relevantly different from theirs, uh, then under those circumstances, um, uh, I take it it's a substantive um, uh, moral claim that morality tells me um, you've got a reason to join in. Right, so if I can just reply uh, yeah. one time Please to soon. that. Yeah, so I don't see clearly, um, I think, whether or not those the worries I articulated sort of filter through to those kinds of cases, but I, I worry that they will, that, um, mm -hmm. and, and this does tie into a second worry that I had, which was uh, you're tying the reasons we have to um, intentions that people have. I, I worry that, that that was crossing, blurring the line between normative reasons and motivating reasons. Uh. Um, that a lot of a lot of what you said sort of made sense. We think about you know the reasons that people are acting on, uh, but then when we allow that we have normative reasons that we're not acting on, if the group has normative reasons that it's not acting on, then um, why couldn't sort of I have participatory normative reasons that I'm not acting on? Um, but I, I've I've said my piece now. So um, yeah, um, so. I'll just add one one little thing before we move on. Um, so I'm thinking of um, what I call collective thinking. Actually, let's, let's take us to here. Um, as a genus with more than one species. Um, so uh, it's, it, it involves seeing the worth of what we can or are doing together. Um, as providing me individually um, with a reason for supporting our doing so. Um, and one, the kind of case that I, I'm wanting to concentrate on in this talk is the case where the action is being performed um, and there's a reason for me to join in. Um, and then there's a, a range of other cases in which, um, so the action isn't being performed um, and there's a reason for me to be doing what um, may encourage it to occur or what may help to initiate it. Um, and uh, there are also uh, reasons for me to um, uh, possess certain um, attitudes towards our acting together of um, uh, encouraging them, feeling responsibility for, for our, our doing something and, and so forth. Um, and um, I actually tend to think that this is a, a fairly primitive feature of uh, moral thought. Um, and so that it, it doesn't derive from a general principle that reasons for a group are thereby reasons for individuals, um, but uh, arises through recognition of the value of what we can do together as bearing on my agency as an individual. Um, but th there's lots more food for thought in the questions you've raised. Thanks, Derek. John Hawthorne has a follow-up on this. Oh, yes. I, I, I was just going to say that um, I think it's easy to see that the sort of, as, as Steve was suspecting his the sort of concern he was articulating would carry over to activities that are ongoing. I mean, take the sort of classic stag hunt scenario that uh, was first articulated by Rousseau in a discourse on inequality, but has become like a pervasive example in, in game theory. I mean, let's have a two-person stag hunt where you and I are in the ongoing activity of uh, hunting a stag, and we know that the chances of success are extremely low um, if, uh, if, if one of us defects. Uh, and a while's gone, there's no guarantee of success anyway, but there's a decent chance. And uh, there's hair around, and I have to 
decide and I can't and you know uh, but but if if one of us defects there's there's no way we're gonna hardly any chance of catching the stag maybe the way it works is I scare the stag in the direction of where I expect you to be in the in the wood or something okay so I'm I'm deciding whether to defect and and go after the hair I can have guaranteed hair as a group we're much better off getting the and it's pretty likely as a group, if we work together as a group, we'll get the stag and the stag is much better than the hare. But you'd have thought that if I, if it's very likely on my evidence that you're gonna defect, then even though as a group, uh, we're better off pursuing the hare, uh, it's perfectly reasonable for me to run off to the hare too. I mean, that's, I mean, that's sort of, the, the way it sort of goes if the, I mean, I don't have to have knowledge even if it's extremely likely on my evidence that you're gonna be defecting by now and running after the hare, then even though as a, plur, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a group of two, we're much better off in expectation going after the stag than, than the hare. Uh, and the activity is now ongoing. Uh, individually, if, if my pessimism is, is strong enough, it seems rational for me to, for me to defect and go after the hair. So that's just a sort of a little, very standard kind of example from game theory that implements the theme that, um, that uh, Steve was articulating, except for an ongoing activity uh, instead. You know? Yeah, um, and I suppose the answer I was trying to offer to that was um, that in this case, there's a question of whether we are together hunting the stag or not. Um, and at, at the moment, that's been undetermined. Um, or actually, if um, uh, you're- well, We could have been together chasing the stag through the wood, you know? Yeah. We saw a stag, we made a, a little yeah. pact where, uh, you know, with, uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit hard to say we're not chasing the stag right now. I, I spot the hare, but it's a bit hard to say we're not chasing the stag. We're not hunting the stag when we've both got our spears or crossbows, and we're we've been running after a stag, and the stag's in view, and we've been now and then making little signals to one another. I mean, it's a bit rough to say we're not hunting this. We haven't been hunting. We're not in the activity of hunting a stag right now. Right. Um, yeah. And so here we're we're engaged in the activity of hunting the stag right now. Um, and I'm pretty sure that you're going to defect. Um, so the implications I take it are that um, uh, the, the value of catching the, the stag, so that, that's the, the end of the activity, um, uh, that's sufficient to make it worthwhile for me to do what will encourage us to be able to catch it. Um, so, and this, this is what I've been doing so far. I've been expressing a conditional uh, willingness to cooperate with you in, in catching it, uh, conditional upon your uh, doing so as well. Um, but given my knowledge that you're likely to defect, that's knowledge that um, we're actually unlikely to achieve the end to which our activity is directed. Um, and that, uh, as I'm conceiving of it, um, casts doubt on whether there is uh, su sufficient reason for me um, to be uh, joining in um, uh, this activity. So, so it, it Raises right, the but, but I thought that, that Steve's idea was, yes, yeah. there isn't good reason for me to join in the activity, but there, uh, there is nevertheless good reason for us to pursue the stag. I mean, that was the line of argument, that there's a great reason for us, for, for, the, for the group to hunt the stag, namely, the if the group hunts, hunts the stag, the group will almost certainly catch the stag. So, I mean, I'm just repeating his argument. I'm not evaluating it. I'm just trying to bypass the, 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 the one little wrinkle, which the, the, his idea was, there's an awesome reason for the group to go after the stag, because if the group goes after the stag, the group will get the stag. So that's great reason for the group, but individually there's great reason to 
defect. I mean, I'm just reproducing his argument, except in a setting where the uh, activity is ongoing. If, uh, yeah. So I, I think the key thing is whether in this scenario you think that there's, well, there's great reason for each individual, supposing they have uh, two directed pessim pessimism each way, well, there's great reason for each individual to de defect. Nevertheless, for the we, there's awesome reason for the we to pursue, uh, which was the, uh, the, 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 the animating theme of his argument. Yeah, and um, I think what this is showing me is that um, I need to uh, refine what, what I'm um, describing as a, a joint actions being worthwhile. Um, uh, so um, what, what this example shows is that um, uh, hunting the stag is worthwhile in the sense that um, it's directed towards an end, which would be great for us to achieve together. Um, right. Uh, but what um, we're injecting into the case is uh, questions about the likelihood um, that this action will actually attain the end uh, to which it's directed. Um, Just one more little thing. Remember that jointly hunting the stag will almost certainly achieve success in the in the setting. I mean, the activity of jointly hunting the stag is almost certainly going to get success. Of course, my hunting the stag won't, but the jointly hunt, so the, the joint activity will almost certainly get success. Yeah, but, but I, I suppose what is also true is that given given the attitudes of the members of the group, um, the likelihood of this group's uh, achieving that end is yes, um, yes. insufficient yes. To, to give me a reason to continue participating. That, that's yes, the, and I, that, I'm that's sure that the, the, anyway, uh, I just think it's a, it's a good example to sort of uh, build some refinements. It is, around, it sure. is, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you. Steph Collins is next. Thanks. Yeah, I get it. this might build on some of the stuff that um, John was just saying, maybe because it's kind of about, you know, expected utility approaches as alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just, I'm curious about why we should engage in this collective thinking way of approaching these problems rather than more standard ways of approaching them. So you seem to, you're assuming that individuals are contributors, right? So you're not you're, am I right in thinking you're not meaning to deal with these kind of alleged no difference collective harm cases? Those aren't your concern, right? You're assuming that people do in fact, are in fact contributing. And then it just seems like then, okay, there are two kinds of cases. There's it's either like an incremental good case where each contribution does some good, in which case surely my contribution can give me reason to contribute, or it's a case with like a threshold, um, in which case we just say that my reason to contribute um, exists if there's some chance of me being the person who gets the group over the, th the threshold for producing the good. Um, why should, why, why is your, why is your approach preferable to that kind of approach? Um, yeah. So, so my claim um, is that there's a, a, a transition in ordinary moral thought between um, recognizing the importance of what we, we do together um, to accepting that I've got a reason to join in. Um, and I think of this as a, applying across the, the whole spectrum of um, cases that you've, you've just uh, mentioned, but also as including the case in which um, uh, when I see that the, there's a demonstration, let's say, um, that's uh, doing, doing something valuable, either is likely to change the, the government's mind or at least is uh, you know, producing a powerful... Uh, statement of opposition. Um, and the expected value of my joining in the demonstration is very small. Um, uh, but that's equally true of everyone else, um, of, of each individual. Um, uh, then my seeing that I'm in the same position as everyone else, this valuable action is only taking place because others who are similarly situated like me um, are joining in, um, that that provides me uh, with a reason independently 
uh, of a calculation of um, the expected value of my uh, joining in for doing so. That's that's the claim. Um, so uh, it would be um, true, I think, that uh, if all cases in which there were good reasons to join in a, um, a joint action were cases in which um, the expected value of my joining in um, also recommended doing so, uh, then what I'm calling participatory moral reasons um, would uh, either be redundant or they'd, they'd just be offering further support for actions we've already got um, other reasons to perform. Um, but I think that uh, there are cases of that positive kind in which it's um, not so obvious that there's uh, the expected value of uh, my joining in is uh, uh, sufficient to produce a, a strong case for doing so. Um, and then cases of the negative kind in which, say, um, there's a theatre performance, I sneak into the back of the theatre, um, I clap at all, all the right times, I kind of add to the en enjoyment of the rest of the audience and so on. Um, and it's not clear that there's a, any significant expected disvalue of my doing so. Um, but uh, the, I, I do, morally speaking, face the question, why aren't you prepared to pay, pay the costs along with everyone else? Um, because uh, you know, pay, paying customers or what makes this, this event happen? You're being a free rider. Um, so it's not, I, I suppose what I'm suggesting is that there um, uh, se seem to be reasons to participate, which um, partly overlap with uh, considerations of um, expected benefit or disbenefit, um, but not entirely. And ask a quick follow up just about whether these reasons are really independent. Um, so it seems like so you you say that I have these reasons only if I'm contributing, right? So it has, and I I guess maybe this is now a question about what you mean by contributing. So I would have thought I contribute to the good outcome and the good case and the bad outcome and the bad case, um, just if I kind of raise the likelihood of the good thing or the the bad thing occurring, and that's what the expected value kind of account will focus on. So if you're going to say that these participatory reasons are reasons to contribute in the good case or not contribute in the bad case, I'm going to only have these reasons in cases where I'm producing expected value or, or disvalue by, by participating, right? So, so it, right? <laughs> They're not, the, the reasons aren't completely independent of whether I'm producing the relevant expected value. So I still think they are. So, so um, contribution could be a matter of um, causal contribution, which is in a, in a really large group. Uh, the causal contribution of each is so small um, that uh, although there's some expected value of doing so, I might, uh, you know, there's some tiny probability of my triggering some uh, threshold, for, for example, um, uh, it may be very, very small. Um, and the demonstration case is a, is a case of that kind. Um, so each of us makes a causal contribution to a, a message being sent to the government. There's a um, broadly linear correlation between the strength of the message and the number of uh, uh, demonstrators. Um, but the case for me to join in is, is what's so special about you. This important thing is being done uh, because people who are situated exactly like you or, or all of the others of whom um, make a very small uh, uh, expected um, difference to the, um, of the achievement of the goal of the, uh, the joint action. Um, Everyone else is uh, joining in on on that understanding. So so why aren't you? That's the um, the force of the case for joining in. 
All right, our next question is from Daniel Wynn, and he's asked me to read out the question for him. Uh, so I will do that now. My question is that in the case of a worthwhile group with a bad subgroup, do I have any moral reasons or obligation to object to the bad subgroups action? Example, militant veganism. Veganism for me is a worthwhile cause, but promoters of such a doctrine can fall into subgroups. In this case, a scientific group and a militant group. The scientific group aims to promote veganism with health facts, studies and documentaries. The militant group shames meat eaters, meat eaters to promote <clears throat> veganism. While according to Garrett's argument, I have a reason to join the scientific group, do I also have a reason or obligation to object to the militant group's action? If not, does that mean that the veganism movement tolerates the militant group's action, which brings the worthwhileness of the movement into question? Um, so I suppose I see that as a separate question. Um, so I don't think I have a participatory reason to object to the militant uh, subgroup. Um, uh, and I, I guess there's a more general question, under what uh, conditions do I have a reason to object to um, so, some bad group activity? Um, after all, you know, there are lots of those in the world. Um, and so in, in general, I would see that as um, uh, likewise a um, question with respect to which it's easy to, to identify my having a reason to do so. Um, and the question of whether all things considered I have, um, uh, I'm morally required to do so uh, depends on all of the other things that I'm uh, doing with my time instead. And, and perhaps also um, questions about uh, special relationships I might bear to this, um, uh, this particular bad activity. Dimitri Gallo is next. Thanks so much for the talk. So uh, I, I was hoping you could help me think through a case. Um, so uh, I'm imagining that there's some absolutely devastating disease spreading around the world. You know, and um, it's the kind of disease that if it's not stopped, about half the population is gonna die. But if 90% of people get vaccinated against it, then almost nobody will die. And then imagine in, in that circumstance, there's a very tiny percentage of the population, you know, way less than 10% that uh, faces a much higher probability of having a kind of negative reaction to the vaccine. And if I was thinking about in a case like that, it seems like that small segment of the population has a kind of good excuse for not getting it. Um, they say, what's so different about you? They say, well, I have this, you know, I have this condition where I'm more likely to have the negative consequences. But when I was thinking about applying the test, I, I imagine I'm supposed to ask, well, suppose that everybody had that higher probability of having the negative reaction. And I was thinking, well, if, you know, if, if the negative reaction isn't, is it, as if, if everyone having that higher probability of the negative reaction is it doesn't come close to being as bad as half the population dying from the disease, then everyone wouldn't have a reason in that case to not get, we would still think that everyone should band together and get the vaccine because it's much, much better for, you know, there to be a couple of bad consequences from the vaccine than for half the population to die. And so that, that was a, a case where I was thinking that the test of what if everybody had that reason, would we, would, you know, would the group have reason to not pursue the, the end in that case? I was thinking that that was a case where the test was going uh, wrong. And I was thinking you might think something like, well, the reason that these people have for exempting themselves from the vaccine isn't that they have a higher probability or you know, that they have this probability, but maybe that they have a higher probability than most people do. Um, but, when I, but then when I tried to apply the test to that reason, it seemed like I was supposed to imagine that everyone had a higher probability than most people do. And then that just feels like, well, it's impossible for everyone to have a higher probability than most people do. So um, yeah, so can you help me think about the, the case, whether, am I getting your account correct that it's saying that in this case, uh, the people with the higher probability of a negative reaction um, don't have a good excuse, uh, and and do you think that that's the right result? Okay, so um, let me get my head around the the example. 
Um, so we've got the 10% who um, face uh, a high probability of a really bad reaction. Um, uh, and they're um, arguing that they shouldn't be required to uh, take the vaccination because of the uh, impact on them. Um, and I then um, uh, am wanting to um, say that to the extent that they're justified in doing so, they can say, um, uh, if everyone's um, health was threatened to the same e extent as ours is, um, if you had a, a, a complete group of um, people, all of whom had the same um, uh, potential cost um, and the same expectation of, of that cost um, being realised, um, uh, would it be um, worthwhile uh, for uh, them to be uh, vaccinating themselves? And the answer there um, in, in the cases where uh, not vaccinating yourself is okay is plausibly going to be no. Um, so here, I suppose if we, yeah. Um, at what point is that uh, reasoning failing? Um, so, so if uh, all of the participants would face face with the same um, prospect, uh, would it be worth the whole population? Getting themselves vaccinated when when the um, uh, probabilities were that then everyone ends up um, uh, worse off than if they hadn't been vaccinated. And then since since the um, answer in that case is uh, no, you shouldn't all get vaccinated because you uh, you're likely to um, make yourself on on balance worse off. Uh, then you're not making an objectionably special case of yourself and saying uh, there's too much at stake for me in order for it to be reasonable to require me to, to vaccinate. So I just, sorry, just, I, I was thinking that it was that if, even if everyone had this slightly higher probability of having negative consequences, it would be much, much better for everyone to get vaccinated than, I mean, this is like, you know, bubonic plague, like 50% of the population dead. So it's, you know, it would be, we would much prefer to have everyone get vaccinated than to let this disease spread. But given that we we only need 90% for herd immunity to kick in and everyone to be fine, mm -hmm. and we definitely know we're gonna be above 90%, it seems fine. Like it's, well, I mean, the, the intuition I was having was that it would be fine for this small segment of the population to face these higher costs to exempt themselves. From this yeah, problem. yeah. Um, and there, I think, so, I think even um, uh, without your 10% group, um, suppose, uh, you know, what, what we need in order for a vaccine to be effective is for, you know, 90% of the population to, to get vaccinated. And then there's a kind of tailing off of the benefit to the rest of the population that's produced by the last, uh, you know, 5% getting getting vaccinated. Um, uh, once we get to the very last person, um, uh, the um, case for participation actually starts to starts to drop off. Um, um, and when we ask here, um, with the group as a whole, um, uh, how important is it um, for uh, every member of the, the population to get vaccinated? Um, uh, the answer to that is that um, uh, the difference between 99% getting vaccinated and 100% getting vaccinated is, is small. Um, and consequently, 
when we go back to the, the case in which um, we have uh, achieved uh, vaccination in the 90% and we've got your 10% who are going to be more challenged if they do so, um, then uh, when we ask, is it worthwhile for the group to get the last 10% vaccinated? Um, the answer here is going to be no, um, because we, we've got protection. We compromise the, uh, the health of the, the last 10%. And so um, the joint action in which 100% of people get vaccinated is, is um, something we together have less reason to um, uh, institute than an action in which 90% of us gets vaccinated and the vulnerable 10% don't. Um, so we look at it from the point of view of the group um, uh, and compare um, the actions in which the 10% do and the 10% and the don't. Does that? Is it, is it okay if I follow, follow up, Kevin? Um, I actually had a, a, um, a follow up on this point as well, which I think might, um, <laughs> Might might speak to this, um, and then yeah, if, if I can put you in the queue in the end, Dimitri, um, if we do have time uh, later on. But we've got a couple other people, um, so I, I wanted to ask about a similar question. I think this might have been what um, Dimitri was still wondering about, but it seemed to me like there are um, some cases where the generalization criterion might run into trouble of the same kind that Dimitri was suggesting. If we thought about it in the second way, where we think of um, what if I was uh, more likely what if everyone was more likely than everyone to or, um, to uh, have a bad reaction? But the case I was thinking of was like a rescue case where um, we have two people who are in need of rescue, say Steve and Dimitri are in need of rescue. And there, there are 10 of us, five are needed to rescue each person. Um, I see that five people are already rescuing Steve. Well, then I should rescue Dimitri. I should help out in that effort, it seems. Um, and so this is a kind of case where I should be responsive to what others are doing um, but it seems like this runs into problems with the generalization criterion, um, because how do I think about this? So I ask, suppose everyone had the same reasons I have um, for not participating in rescuing Steve. Um, well, what are those reasons? Well, I see that there are five people rescuing Steve already. Um, okay, suppose everyone could see that some people were rescuing Steve. That doesn't, that seems like a contradiction, right? It doesn't seem like that, that's a possible state of affairs. Um, and so I, I wondered how to think about generalizability in this kind of case. And I think that there's a similar kind of case to what um, Dimitri was getting at with the, uh, you have a small proportion in the population who would have this negative side effect. Yeah, so what, what these questions are um, showing is that um, the issue here concerns what, we, what we're taking fixed um, when, when we make these counterfactual yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and here, in, in your case, when the reasons I have um, for helping Dimitri, I think it was, are that um, uh, Steve's already being looked after and my joining in um, the Steve rescue is uh, not going to um, uh, uh, contribute uh, to a... Uh, more worthwhile action than the one that's already being performed. Um, and uh, consequently, um, uh, it makes more sense for me to um, join the action where my labor is required rather than the one where my labor isn't required. Um, so uh, in a circumstance in which the group is one, all of whose members can say, um, uh, that uh, Steve is being helped by members of a, another group, by, by others, um, and uh, our labour is all better spent um, saving someone else um, uh, than um, the uh, joint action um, that we're now performing um, is, is one that uh, passes the relevant tests. That's that's the thought. Okay. Uh, the next question then is from Jay Allnut. Oh, 
Kia ora, Garrett. Thank you for your talk. Um, I've got my question, I guess it might be similar to um, Dimitri's, is about um, the idea of how, how do we see dissent as a kind of example of demonstration or protest? So you said that there's, for instance, if you're part of a group, that you might have a generalised reason to sign a, a, a um, you know, a, a part of protest or a petition, that's the word I'm looking for, thank you. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking of an example, for instance, what if I have reasons not to accept uh, very low income or very low status employment? If I'm unemployed and I've got, you know, and there might be reasons for me to say, uh, as a type of dissent or a type of protest that I don't, I won't accept low status employment for reasons of self-respect, esteem, dignity, right? So, um, but I also have a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons not to <clears throat> undertake that action, even though I might be doing it as part of a, a group. So there's a very low probability that my dissent in that instance is going to resolve the issues, you know, the, re the, co the, the, the reasons I have for not accepting the role, uh, the, the employment. Uh, there's going to be an immediate negative impact on me. You know, I won't have the income. I may lose benefits, etc. Um, and I also have other reasons, duties towards being employed, contributing to a, the broader group I'm part of, which is you know society in general, paying taxes, etc. So I'm just thinking. You know, the answer might be obvious, or it might be very similar to Dimitri's, but I'm just wondering how that would fit in here in terms of the collective thinking. Yeah. So um, here the question is. Uh, do I have a reason to um, join in some uh, broader joint action of dissent or protest? Um, and I think here, here, at least to that question about a pro tanto reason, um, then the answer is uh, pretty straightforwardly yes. I mean, the, there is something valuable about the um, overall uh, dissent or protest. Um, and Consequently, there's, there's a reason for me to join in. Um, but when, when we add the further costs to me um, that uh, you've also supplied in the example, um, then uh, I'm inclined to think that um, uh, these tests that we've just got on the screen uh, are, are going to um, vindicate the idea that um, uh, the, the cost to me of joining in um, these forms of dissent is uh, significant. It's not, not the same as uh, for people who have um, other uh, secure forms of income and so on, and for, for whom it's easier to um, take this kind of stand. Um, so uh, given, given that um, if everyone were required to bear the same kinds of costs in order to uh, make this uh, protest, um, it's not clear that uh, this would be required of, of everyone. Um, it can't be required of me. So, so I, I would think this falls into the second, second of these three categories. But thank, thanks, for the, thanks for the question. All right, um, Steve, you said you had more questions um, that you wanted to ask. Uh, for the end of the queue, yes. So if yeah, we we're, just, we're now we're now at the end of the queue. The end of the queue. Um, um, shall we just pause very briefly to see if anyone else is is sitting on a on a question but hasn't put their hand up yet? Looks like I see Robert Audi. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, Robert, you can go ahead. Okay, I'll try to make this short. Um, I have an observation favorable to Garrett's picture, I believe, and then a question related to some of the others. I would say that the reasons to join a worthwhile activity uh, go well with the idea of treating humanity as an end, treating others as ends in themselves. I would also say there are fittingness considerations that favor the broad picture you've painted. But let me get to my questions, unless you want to comment on that. I'm wondering how basic the participatory moral reasons are, it looks as though they might be understood as extensions of reasons of beneficence. That anyway, if one takes the not implausible view that cooperative human activity under good conditions has value in itself, 
Um, there are also fairness considerations which come in at certain points. And I'm wondering how much weight they actually carry. In some cases, one is benefiting from the worthwhile, worthwhile activity in question, in which case the question of free writing arises. Uh, but in any case, um, if you couldn't give a reason for not joining, uh, which roughly speaking, uh, others similarly situated uh, could have, uh, then it looks as though fairness comes in. So you might want to respond to some of those concerns. You yeah. already have, really. Well, no, no. This, this is, this is good. So, um, I suppose I tend to want to resist the idea that um, uh, reasons of participation can be reduced to reasons of beneficence or derived from reasons of beneficence. Um, through thinking about cases of free riding, in which um, what the free rider is free riding on is the production of a non-rival public good. Um, and I suppose I think of my example of sneaking into the back of the theatre as an example of this. So, so where it, it's implausible to say that I've harmed any other um, theatre goer or um, theatre owner or anything of that, that kind. So um, in terms of... Uh, concern for others' welfare, um, that doesn't gi give me a compelling reason not to sneak into the theatre. But the, the, um, the complaint um, to be made of me is not, you don't care enough about other people's welfare, um, but what's so special about you? Um, so the theatre performance is only taking place because it's, uh, other um, theatre goers are willing to pay the um, the understood cost, um, you're helping yourself to the, the benefits without paying the cost. Um, and I suppose the general suggestion here in this talk is that that's a, a species of a more general um, uh, form of unselfishness, which is um, a, a willingness to infer from um, the value of what uh, we can achieve together, um, my possessing a reason to contribute to our achieving that um, uh, as, as a group. Um, I do see all this. I'm just wondering whether um, unselfishness isn't a virtue and a virtue partly because the activities we contribute to generously have value in themselves. So coming back to the question about beneficence, why not say that beneficence obligates us to have reason to decline to do good in the way of cooperating with others, which is one kind of good in itself? I don't know that you need to resist this. I'm not suggesting it's the only consideration, but I don't see why it can't be one of them. Sorry, you, you're saying that um, beneficence gives us reason to decline? To... Uh, no, um, it gives us reason not to decline. Right. Um, Since here's something we can easily do that is part of a good. Uh, one good is what the group intends to achieve as a result. Uh, but another good is the cooperative activity. And if I participate constructively there, why am I not contributing to the good? And why doesn't that constrain what I have to say if I want to explain declining? Yeah, so, so if all of the um, reasons that made joint actions worthwhile um, related to promotion of welfare in one way or another, um, then I think uh, we would then uh, have a picture on which um, uh, at least reasons of group beneficence um, were primary and uh, reasons to participate in the activities of groups were uh, derivative from those. Um, I suppose I, I do tend to think that there are um, reasons of respect uh, that 
themselves um, uh, cannot be um, uh, reduced to uh, reasons of beneficence um, and can equally apply at, at the group level. Um, so constraints on paternalism, um, reasons of respect for rights uh, that um, it may not be uh, beneficial or advantageous for the rights bearers to uh, exercise. Um, uh, and so these, these are going to generate um, non-welfare based uh, uh, reasons, both for individual action and for joint action. And when they um, uh, make joint action worthwhile, then the reasons for joining in the, those joint actions are not themselves going to be beneficence based. As, as Good. Well. Thanks. All right. Well, we're over time. So I think I'm going to stop us there with apologies to uh, Steve and Dimitri for not getting to their further questions. Um, so let's all thank our speaker. Well, thank you very much for, for the very stimulating discussion.